And good day and welcome to Navigate B2B. I am your host, uh, Steve Ferreira, and I am CEO of Ocean Audit, a global ocean freight refund consultancy company here in, well, I was gonna almost give away my new location, but I'm still gonna leave it up. I'll tell you what, I'm actually in my new location. You probably can recognize from the background here, don't have the typical ocean audit, high quality studio. We're building studio 2.0. But I can tell you one thing, the three places that we were going to move to were LA, Miami, and New York. LA has been eliminated. I am so sorry, California friends, but the North Ridge fault line, the earthquakes, the wildfires, Miley Cyrus losing her house, it was just all too much for my wife to take. So we're in the ballpark now for New York and Miami. So I'll keep you abreast. I am in one of the locations now that is probably the front runner, but I'll keep that a secret as we go on. So great to have my audience today at Navigate B2B. We are really looking at some great things coming up in the next month or two. My second book, Navigating B2B, uh, soon to be uh, my second USA Today bestseller, will be dropping in stores everywhere uh, after the 4th of July. And we're just totally excited about the uh, great pre-reviews that that book is coming, uh, has coming. And it's a total way for you to master your industry, your business, and yourself. So look for more information on uh, Navigate B2B and my author site on Amazon.com, Steve Ferrer. It's been a really whirlwind week in the world of international shipping. And a couple of things that I wanted to talk about to start to show off. And I think one of this is a really interesting observation from my colleague and friend and LinkedIn partner, uh, Lars Jensen. And Lars has brought up the fact that the Express uh, Pearl had a caustic uh, fire, hazardous fire, which caused a lot of damage. It was a brand new uh, 2700 TEU ship. And so the analogy there is that the Ever Given Yes, that famous Memi ship is back in the news. It's still in Egypt after two months. And the fact that that ship may still have hazardous chemicals on it or hazardous materials gives call to action that how long can these uh, chemicals be stable? So there's some talk, and Lars you know, brought up a good point, that the Ever Given at some point may have to be offloaded. It's a real tumultuous situation, very dynamic situation in uh, the Great Bitter Lake in Egypt. And so we'll have to see what happens with the Ever Given. But I thought it was really interesting that uh, the hazardous issue, you know, has not been taken uh, in, into consideration on the Ever Given. So more to follow on that. That's a really fascinating uh, information. Probably equally fascinating <laughs> back in our pond, so to speak, in the USA. Now, I have so much respect for the great uh, men and women managing our ports around the country. As a matter of fact, I did an in-depth uh, study at the Port of Miami recently. But one of the things that I wanted to just mention is how uh, the Port of Los Angeles and Oakland have experienced significant vessel backlogs. And I won't bring up the marine traffic uh, geo positioning satellites to show you all the vessels in port, but suffice to say, Oakland has uh, uh, accumulated about 12 to 15 vessels at port and Los Angeles still has 15 to 20 vessels at port now. But what's really interesting, I, I'm sorry, at, at anchor or at anchor waiting for port berthing. But what's really interesting about that is that L.A. Port Director Gene Soroka, who I have tremendous respect for, in a recent interview back in May, Gene had said that he, he felt the backlog on L.A. Um, uh, port um, access would be cleared by June 1st. Well, we're almost there and they still have 20 vessels out in the, uh, in the channel waiting berthing. So it's a real tumultuous situation in Los Angeles, very flexible, still no sign that contain container getting uh, 3.0 or, or at this point uh, 4.0 is gonna be letting up. So really, really significant information. And uh, that, um, that piece of uh, market intel also comes to me, me in part by one of the great talented writers, Greg Miller of Freight Waves, terrific uh, um, you know, industry writer, one of the best in the business and uh, turning into a really good friend and, and, and we love to bounce ideas. And I think that's what it really comes down to in this industry is knowing who you know, 
having the connections, as the Chinese say, I think, is it the guangxi? I lived in China for a couple of years, and I'm trying to think what the word for connections there. Um, John Monroe, my great friend, could tell me. But having those connections is uh, really paramount and uh, tantamount to doing a great job in the industry and being able to communicate on programming like Freight Waves and the great new host that Freight Waves has, putting out so much content and so privileged to be able to give you the maritime programming that you need here on Navigate B2B. And I can't think of another person that I've become really close to and I respect as the consummate professional as my guest today. And my guest is Rebe Rebecca Fenneman. Rebecca is a founding member, member of uh, Jeffrey Fenneman Law and Rebecca is a former uh, general counsel of the Federal Maritime Commission. Rebecca, welcome so much to the show today. Oh, Steve, thank you so much for that warm introduction. It's such a privilege and a pleasure to be on your show, and it's always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Well, I think the world of you, and you know, there's so much in my career and my life where uh, the Federal Maritime Commission, you know, I've always looked at it as a um, an entity, you know, 30 years ago where uh, I felt it was, you know, dynamic and it, it was like, you know, the, the long arm of the government uh, involved in ocean shipping. And I know so much has changed and in, in how uh, and, and why and what the FMC has been involved with. Uh, I just want to make clear to my audience now that you have uh, you have departed the FMC and you've been in your, your own private practice now for, has it been a couple of years now or a year? Uh, well, I left the FMC uh, uh, as of April 1, 2020, so it's just been a year. We launched, I launched a, a Jeffrey Fenneman Lawn Strategy with my partner, Eric Jeffrey, uh, on January 1st of 2021. So well, we're still uh, fresh into this business, although we know the shipping industry very well. And of course, I know uh, everything that's going on, you know, at the FMC, um, and, and I, I want to thank you again, too, for raising the profile of that agency, because uh, not a lot of folks know about it. Um, and I think their work can be made much better, and they always are uh, much helped and much improved by more participation um, by everyone in the industry. So thanks for putting the spotlight on the FMC. Oh, listen, I, I tell you, thank you for mentioning it. You know, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, as far as the FMC is concerned, right? I always look at it as the paramount. I look at it as our Supreme Court. And I've actually, um, I don't think my many of my audience members know this, but I've actually served on four important uh, cases as an expert witness, you know, at the FMC level, been subpoenaed. Um, I, I find the whole process fascinating. I mean, some of the depositions I've been through were just, you know, the, 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 it's like, I know why I love ocean because you just never know what's going to hit you next. And I think that what you and I have gone through, I mean, you've done great in changing careers. I mean, I think that your FMC experience gives you the niche that um, maritime leaders, uh, you know, other uh, intermodal entities and regulatory bodies in the U S I'm sure, you know, your phone is starting to ring off the hook as, as is mine. So congratulations on your niche as well. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, it was just such a, a, a privilege and an honor to work for so long with so many very, very talented and dedicated public servants. Um, not only the folks that you cross paths with in, in the litigation context, but the economists and the analysts uh, and, and the policy uh, uh, staff members who, you know, keep everything working and, you um, uh, and then to get to know this industry, I mean, really, I started out not knowing anything about shipping and um, wanted to do just international trade. But I got pulled into this shipping business because I think to me, it's all about the people. The people are so fascinating. The work is incredibly fascinating. And you have crazy events happening like, you know, like the Ever Given. I mean, it's never a dull <laughs> moment. And um, that was our that was our Super Bowl. That was our right? Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and and um, and for for shipping lawyers, it's boy, it's uh, um, I mean, it's 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 one of these you know knots that has to be untangled and will take a long time to get untangled. Um, but in the meantime, it's it's intellectually you know stimulating, really creative. And I think um, you know what 
what impressed me about the industry too is not only the personalities are great, but um, but you know the meaningfulness of the work. So I'm just I've just been so happy to be a small part of it and to um, to have been you know able to meet so many fascinating wonderful people and uh, folks folks like you and and you know you mentioned a few others, um, uh, but but the folks um, on the on the government side and the policy side, um, you know, are are really dedicated to. So I want to definitely give them a shout out as well. Yeah, and and you know, we're seeing I, I think almost a renaissance. And uh, uh, you know, when I started in the industry back in the '80s, right? I, I you know, the FMC was uh, extraordinarily powerful. There was tariffs. There was I don't know if you remember ATFI, A-T-F-I, the Automated Tariff Filing System. I actually, so I'm going to date myself here, but I actually came in um, right when the Ocean Shipping Reform Act had been passed, and I was brought in um, as a, a young lawyer to this big team, team that had to rewrite basically all of the FMC regulations to conform to the new statute, and ATFI was one of the things that just, it went the way of the dodo. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. We, you know, we felt that, you know, AFI for all of its problems um, was, there was actually some benefit to it. Um, and if the industry maybe, you know, 30 years ago had, had adopted some more standards, <laughs> standardization, so, you know, we wouldn't have all, all the problems we have now. I know that digital standardization is like, you know, it's, it's the, uh, 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 m word of the day kind of thing at, at all times. And, you know, ATFI, you raise ATFI. So the automated tariff filing information system. Wow, um, you got ATFI. it. Wow, you're good. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, and I think I think that I wish <laughs> I think some of our, our beneficial cargo owner friends, uh, they don't really know what we're speaking of, but it was an electronic way to go in and do a, a search either in a tariff or a contract. And I think that given the way, you know, it's interesting how things come around, right? I think some of our friends out there would like to see that back to keep a little bit more better tap on things. Yeah, well, it, you know, you were required to have a bottom line rate calculation and all of this other stuff that, you know, kind of people are reinventing the wheel on that. So anyway, <laughs> well, nothing, nothing new, nothing old is new again, whatever, but, uh, but it's, oh, Rebecca, yeah, you, you're bringing, you, you're bringing, you're uh, really <laughs> Flashing back to uh, peace Flash. and love and, you know, groovy and like, you know, psychedelic right. uh, writing. No, but it was really an interesting system because, you know, I remember um, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember what it was, but I had a, uh, the predecessor of, uh, of Ocean Audit was a company called Trade Check that was my first company. And Trade Check had a federal government contact, contract with, this, um, with G uh, GSA. Uh, to audit, you know, um, State Department freight bills and, and um, some, not MSC, Military Sea Lift Command, but just general, like, you know, international freight bills. And I remember there was one that we found, and in ATFI, the rate would have uh, resulted in a refund to the government of $600,000. And it went all the way up to the, uh, you know, to the State Department dispute board between the State Department and the contractor. Turns out the contractor had a, um, uh, a, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think what the word was, uh, like a one-off contract, as well as an ATFI filing. And so the government was trying to determine whether the bid, uh, the ATFI filing should have superseded the bid. And ultimately, the government, you know, dropped their, dropped their refund. But it's just interesting that at least ATFI gave some kind of a controlled regulatory, you know, manifestation of the, as you said, the bottom line calculations. So, Right. For the public. I mean, the government government has that um, for their own for when they're acting as a shipper but you know just you know uh, regular BCOs importers or exporters you know I think right probably the would love and, to have and, it and, but anyway yeah, and, no no you're really talking it, it's interesting because I really want to launch into one of the really uh, just to me um, seminal moments in the last uh, couple months on, on something that's happened with the FMC and that's the recent uh, announcement of the National Shippers Advisory Committee. You know, it's funny that we're talking about ad fee and we're talking about rates and we're talking about how BCOs wish something had changed. But this new National um, Shippers Advisory Committee, I guess it's NSAC for short, um, what is it? Why should people be excited about it? 
and what's your take on the meaning of it? Right. Well, I have to give the lawyer's caveat, which is I'm obviously not speaking for the Federal Maritime Commission, and I'm certainly not speaking for any of my clients, um, and I'm not giving legal advice. But as I said before, it's great that you're putting a spotlight on the Federal Maritime Commission um, in this program, because in the next week or so, uh, you will see an announcement posted on the Federal Mar Maritime Commission website, fmc.gov, um, soliciting uh, nominations for the National Shippers Advisory uh, Committee, which is a federal advisory committee. And most federal agencies have these, and it's a way for the industry, the public, the users to have uh, impact on a regulation. And for, this is the first federal advisory committee the FMC has ever had in its history. Um, and for a long time, the commission um, was, was a little nervous, I think, about kicking it off on its own because of the potential expense of running one of these things. And now, but now it's been ordered by Congress and, and law to get one of these started. So what it will be is um, 24 members of uh, 12, uh, 12 members will represent um, importers and 12 will represent exporters. And the big question right now and what the FMC was talking about in its open meeting uh, last week was, will membership be open to intermediaries as well? And that was a question. And my sense from the conversation, we haven't seen it yet, but my sense from the conversation is that yes, intermediaries will be invited to join as well. But the process will be, the Federal Maritime will, Commission will put out the charter, which we'll talk about um, the organization, um, what its mandate is, what the commission wants it to do. Uh, and then uh, a request for nominations. And so members of the industry representing importers and exporters, um, you know, can put their names in the hat uh, and be selected. And I believe the term is a year. So it's a year commitment um, and it's all volunteering. So you won't get compensated, um, but you will have probably direct impact on the adoption of regulation by the Federal Maritime Commission. So it's an opportunity really to have influence on, on the policy making and regulatory body that's responsible for international ocean transportation. So I would encourage everyone to you know, watch the space and get involved um, because going back to what I said before, uh, the more input from the public, the better the policy will be. So um, that's that's my two cents on it. But I would just I and I will be, um, you know, talking about this on my LinkedIn page, uh, definitely. And I know we'll probably be talking about it more as soon as it comes out. So this is an exciting development. You know, Rebecca, it, it, it was just thinking, as you said that so succinctly, this is just terrific kind of, you know, breaking news that um, I know it's been out in drips and drabs and uh, a good friend of mine, John Monroe, has also mentioned the fact about intermediaries being able to be seated on this particular board. So, you know, it will be great. It's good as it stands. And as John's words, it will be great if intermedi intermediaries can be associated with it. But I think it's a seminal moment. And I, I think this is a really major pause, you know, uh, to take in our show today. By the way, you're watching Navigate B2B. I'm your host, Steve Ferreira, with my special guest, Rebecca Fenneman. Rebecca is a founding member of uh, Jeffrey Fenneman uh, Lawrence Strategy, a, a um, ocean maritime um, consulting company, a, con a legal consulting uh, PLLC in, in uh, Washington, D.C., right? Yep, we are in Washington, D.C., and, and we provide representation mostly before the Federal Maritime Commission. So um, our clients are um, the ocean carriers, the OTIs, and um, the BCOs um, that, that need to deal with, with that kind of regulation. And that's the thing uh, to my great audience out there. I mean, we try to bring you the experts of experts here at Navigate B2B. And at least from Rebecca's point, I don't know about me, but you're looking at one of them right now in Rebecca. So it's so great that we have that info on the uh, um, uh, NASC, National Shippers Advisory Committee. Is that what we're calling it? 
Rebecca? National, I think that's right. National Shippers Advisory Committee. And um, we'll know more uh, about it probably in a week or so. Um, it'll, there'll be a, there'll be a federal register notice, but the faster way to get it is just to go to fmc.gov. It'll be on the very front page. Rebecca, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you, you have seen this behind the scenes or you could answer this, but you know, I have so many clients that are, you know, in the fortune 100, um, like, let's say, you know, three of them, you know, want to be on it. I mean, how, how will the FMC look at this in terms of who gets to be on it? Will, will it be based on kind of the story they write, their reason for wanting to be on it? Is it kind of a hand curated, curated type, um, type pick, pecking order, so to speak? Well, it will be hand curated, but um, it's also very large, relatively large. Um, so 12, 12 members uh, for imports, 12 members for exports. Um, that I think what the commission will be looking for is a good broad representation of different commodities, different geographic locations. They'll definitely want to have East Coast, West Coast, Gulf. Um, they'll want to have um, uh, uh, folks that are large importers and exporters, folks that are small, medium. So they'll, I think they'll be looking for a mix from the industry. Um, they'll certainly want to have expertise, um, folks who have, you know, uh, 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 been around a bill of lading and, and know, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what the meaningful, uh, meaningful uh, issues are of the day. And I think also, you know, folks that are, that have, maybe have had experience with the Federal Maritime Commission as well, you know, whether that's, you know, in, in regulation or in, uh, in litigation. So of the past couple of years, um, the commission had, has had a number of what they call fact-finding investigations. And these are, this is not litigation, it's non-adjudicatory. It's, it's really a way for the commission to gather information generally before it makes regulation. Um, and a couple of these were led by Commissioner Rebecca Dye. Um, and her approach was really as a convening authority to bring shippers, carriers, and intermediaries together to try and find market-based solutions to some of these problems. Um, and I think, I don't, you know, that that attempt has, has worked in a lot of instances, but where it can't work, um, this advisory committee, I think, is going to fill in some of those gaps. The other thing the advisory committee is going to do is they're going to, you know, submit written reports and recommendations to the commission that then will be available to the public generally. So we'll keep this debate in, you know, kind of the, the general um, public's consciousness and, and invite additional discussion, which I think is, is, um, is very, very useful and helpful to the, for the Federal Maritime Commission. But they're going to be looking for a, a, a great, you know, a, a, a diversity of, of viewpoints, I think they should. Rebecca, it probably goes without saying that, you know, once this uh, committee is uh, formulated, organized, and, and where discussions begin, certainly they're going to go into, you know, kind of triangulation of probably, you know, rates, ports, infrastructure. I mean, what would you see? Could you have, if you had your crystal ball, I mean, um, what do you see some of the maybe um, bullet points coming out of the first couple of sessions once they do organize? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is is going to be around probably the accessorials that you know has been part of the debate for the past five years, and I'm talking about detention, demurrage, per diem practices, um, and and these notions of kind of fairness. A lot of um, a lot of the industry, you know, rightfully sees these issues from, from their perspective. And um, uh, having that, that's where those, those fact-finding investigation uh, convening um, groups were really useful because they you know, could share information about, well, you know, from my perspective, I'm the carrier, and from my perspective, this is why I need to charge demurrage, and um, this is why you need to pay it. And the shipper would say, well, from my perspective, you know, this is why it's not fair and why I shouldn't be paying it. 
Um, so hearing those kinds of debates and discussions and and getting um, the, the hard work of, of a policymaker is to make rules of general, what do we call rules of general applicability. Things are going to apply in all situations. That's really hard in some of these some of these cases. And that's why in the past, really, the commission has relied on adjudication to solve a lot of these problems. And the thing about adjudication is it solves a problem for the parties, um, but it might not solve um, the problem for the industry writ large. Um, so, so I think you're going to see big discussions about surcharges. You're going to see um, also maybe coming out of it, you know, the, the Federal Maritime Com Commission is a regulatory body. They don't have money to give or grants to make. They, they can't write checks um, to promote infrastructure or pilot projects or um, it, uh, uh, any, any kind of uh, innovations. I mean, they try and support innovations, certainly, and they try and support the industry and the market doing that, but they can't do that themselves. So I think, you know, part of the discussion may also be putting a highlight on where national infrastructure issues and where the federal government can, um, uh, if not uh, carrying some of this innovation incentive, but somehow encouraging the market actors, the industry to do that themselves um, with a little bit of seed money or pilot project here or there, um, and, and just putting, putting the spotlight on some, where some of these blockages and barriers are that are causing um, you know, costs in the system. Because you know, Steve, and that's, that's your business model, right? Um, that's you know, driving costs out of the system is where um, folks um, can agree from their perspective that's very important. But when I drive out of costs, you know, drive out my costs, sometimes you add costs somewhere else to someone else, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's, that brings us around to um, what's the commission views as reasonable or not. Um, and, and a lot of that is, uh, is all in the eye of the beholder. So I think it's, it's going to be a, a, a very useful for the commission, but I think they're going to, they're going to get into some real nuts and bolts of, um, of, of trade practices, of, of, uh, of practices that are happening right now. Um, and, and Steve, we, Go ahead. Yeah, we were we were talking a little bit earlier about um, a particular case that's coming up with them. I know you've you've looked at that. Um, are you <laughs> going to be following it? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, the thing is, is that you know when I get it when when I get a uh, a icon like yourself on my show, I can have eight, 85 questions and you know fill in the blanks. And I I hope you'll um, join me for part two uh, when we have more time. But I think that. Uh, the FMC, uh, the uh, the new um, National Shippers Advisory Committee is really just a seminal moment, and there's no one in the world I would have not wanted to have on my show today other than yourself, Rebecca, to help uh, BCOs understand that. Um, I know I have a ton of other topics I'd love to talk to you about. Would you like to come back on again another time? I would be honored. I'd love to do that. And and Steve, you know, I it's it's just such an easy conversation to have with you, because when I say or when I say Atfi, you know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, just, it's not well, a lot I, of people you can do that with. So thank you. Well, I know you've been on freight waves before, and you know I think that uh, as I said, there are so many interesting things coming up. I'm having a major webinar on a lot of the uh, issues of cost control on July 1st. It'll be exclusively on freight waves. There's so many new things coming on. You, you know, you and I are so connected on LinkedIn and um, I certainly would like to have you back on uh, and we talk more about infrastructure, the Biden administration, ports, regulation. You have so many great insights on operational issues like chassis that most attorneys wouldn't even know how to deal with. So I wanna thank you so much for the time today. Rebecca, and how can we, um, how can our audience find you on LinkedIn or through your professional website? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, um, Jeffrey Fenneman uh, Lawn Strategy, which is uh, my firm with Eric Jeffrey, um, is uh, jeffreyfenneman.com. Uh, you can also find the firm has a uh, LinkedIn page as well. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, 
look me up, Rebecca Fenneman. I would be happy to connect um, with anybody who wants to follow up with our discussion or has any other questions that I can help with the Federal Maritime Commission. Thanks again. I think you'll, I, I, oh, Rebecca, it's my pleasure. I think you'll get a lot of uh, inquiries on this new committee. And uh, Rebecca is an extraordinary communicator. She'll get back to you immediately. So to all my great audience and friends and followers out there, thank you for watching another edition of Navigate B2B. Wishing you all a safe and healthy weekend. And until next week, goodbye. I'm Steve Ferreira signing off. And you've been watching Navigate B2B with my special guest, Rebecca Fenneman. Fenneman, excuse me. Good night, every good day, everyone.